Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session today, Cultivating Learning, Enhancing Storytelling with Digital Museum Objects. So today we'll explore the use of family stories to promote English and Spanish literacy and to nurture family relationships and storytelling habits among children and family members in immigrant origin communities and really in any families. So I'd like to introduce our team today. Um, I'm Philip Rappaport. I'm an educator at the Office of Educational Technology, which is the um, office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. We also have Veronica Boyks Mancia, and she is a, um, a PI for Harvard School of uh, Graduate School of Education Project Zero. She's a research director for Reimagining Migration, and she was also a senior fellow in museum practice in our office, which is is where. Um, Part of the content from today's session came from, and, and much more that we'll we'll talk about too later. Um, we also have Micheline Lavalier, who is a family literacy specialist from Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, her program serves about 250 families a year through 13 schools. And Micheline and I met almost a decade ago and have been experimenting with the use with the family stories um, as a way to reach families. Okay, and then also Carola Suarez Orozco, who is Professor of Human Development and Psychology at UCLA and a distinguished professor in counseling and school psychology, um, University of Massachusetts, Boston. And Carola is also the co-founder of Reimagining Migration. So in today's session, this is one of a series uh, that we call Cultivating Learning. And this is a monthly offering in which featured educators model teaching techniques for using digital technology um, um, in museums and as to support student learning in diverse types of learning environments. So we're going to do a few things together in this session. We'll start off with a brief introduction about logistics, how to use the technology, and then I'll turn it over to our wonderful guests who will actually model transferable activities and techniques, and then we'll open it up to a larger discussion. So while we're getting started, I invite you to please feel free to introduce yourself in the comment or the chat section, who you are, where you're from, what you teach. Uh, what you see here is our schedule for December. So December, we're doing it pretty lightly because um, people are headed off on, they're checking out for vacation, I hope, and holidays. Um, so we just have two drop-in office hour sessions. Come January, we'll, re, we'll come back to our um, a full slate of programming for you. You can find the schedule and links to, to sessions at our help center. So if you see that link at the bottom there, learninglab.si.edu slash help, that's where you can find all kinds of content about how to use the Learning Lab, um, specific examples of each of the features and the technology, and also all of the sessions that we offer, either live or archived versions. You probably know this because you've joined us here today, but the Learning Lab is an online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian and beyond. You can create interactive learning experiences with them, and then you can share those resources with others. We'll be accessing a lot of content in the lab today, and I'll be putting those links in the chat while we speak. Okay, this is what the help page looks like, and. Uh, once I'm not talking, I'll put that link in the chat for you. This is meant to be an interactive session, so please feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat. If you're joining us uh, through YouTube, you could, you'll see the comment section over on the far right. If you're joining us through Facebook, you'll see it down in the bottom center of your screen. And I see lots of people are introducing themselves in the chat. Thank you so much. And to get us started now, before I turn it over, Veronica will get us started. But what we also thought is we could start off with a question. 
So please do put your thoughts in the chat. And the question is, if you were to tell a family story that you would want to pass on to the children in your life, what would it be about? And now I will turn it over to Veronica. Wonderful. So I'll, I'm going to let a little bit of time um, go by so that you can sort of think a little bit about this um, about this question that um, that Philippa posed uh, for us. Uh, thank you, Philippa, for this great framing of this work. Um, the work that we uh, that we're sharing uh, is is really a wonderful collaboration uh, between the Smithsonian Learning Lab and the Reimagining Migration Group, um, Harvard Project Zero, and this particular collection, uh, the Fairfax um, Public Schools, and um, and a group of researchers and practitioners from a variety of uh, of districts, you know, um, with whom we created a seminar to explore the question of how can we respond to the needs of immigrant origin families and kids um, in ways that are um, respectful, um, dignified, uh, and in particular, in ways that invite us to think a little bit about language. So, Philip, if I can move to the next slide, that'd be great. Great. And the next, thank you. So here's a little bit of context for for what we what, why we're doing this work. So we know that we live in a world that is marked by mobility and complexity and diversity and increasingly so. Um, so you see there are some of the stats about you know the scope, the size of this international migration, the globality of it. Uh, the idea that 27% of our kids uh, are of immigrant origin. Um, and the question of institutions, museums, schools, really having an opportunity um, for uh, experimenting with, innovating, and really responding uh, to, uh, to, the, to the richness, the cultural richness, linguistic richness that kids bring, families bring to the work uh, of learning and to the work of becoming members of a more complex and diverse uh, society. So if you think about um, the dimensions, the proportions, the millions of people living outside of the country uh, of origin, you can also imagine the millions and millions of people who are left in the country, in the country who are, who are in, the, in the lands before, so to speak, the lands that they left and um, the impact on are the millions and millions of people in the lands where uh, folks uh, arrive. Philippa, if one can, um, now, all of this complexity is not as simple to manage. When kids arrive in school and our communities, they, fa they face rising xenophobia, lots of myths and misunderstandings about migration, why people migrate. Um, we face the challenge of school, of adult preparedness. We parents need to figure out how to raise bicultural uh, children, um, bilingual children, teachers need to understand a little bit better. We need to understand a little bit better how to, uh, how to open up our classrooms uh, for, these, uh, for, for the kids, um, how to integrate, how to be more inclusive. Um, we face a challenge of fragmented teaching about migration. Kids learn about, kids learn about migration in sort of bits and pieces, a little bit about Ellis Island, a little bit about Angel Island, a little bit about the Great Migration, and maybe a little bit about their own lives. Um, so all of that combined um, is really sort of um, worrying us tremendously because of the question of equity and inequity and the kind of access that kids have to quality education. A particular angle, a particular focus for our day to day is this notion of language as gatekeeping force. You know, when is it the majority of many of the kids who are coming to this country without mastering, without being uh, fully bilingual, being sort of emerging bilingual uh, kids, um, typically attend ELL classes, English language learning classes. Um, and, and the question is, you know, how do we think about, uh, how do we think about the role that language plays uh, in including, not only in terms of how we teach languages, but also how do we use language uh, to make connections, to open up into, to engage into the lives uh, of kids. So if you could can click one more. The 
the paradigm shift that we're exploring in this project is this notion of moving from language as gatekeeper to language as gateway. So language as gatekeeper in the form of the kinds of formal teaching of language as vocabulary and grammar and so forth that are very, very typical in schools and that might get in the way sometimes of kids really enjoying expressing who they are and uh, learning language in a little bit of a more, um, uh, more natural uh, way, the way in which we learn our own uh, languages. Language is gatekeeping in terms of access to academic language. Language is gatekeeping in the and the idea that schools, the idea on which schools are built many times or quite often, which is that there's a monolingual, homogeneous view of the child, homogeneous view of content, and the language is one language, that is the language of teaching and learning, and anything else seems to be a deviation uh, from the norm. There's one culture, and anything else seems to, be a, seems to be a little bit of a deviation from the norm. So how can we move from very, very monolithic views of culture and language in our schools to more complex, dynamic um, ways of thinking about language and language as gateway being um, at the center of this exploration uh, of ours. Um, so in the process um, of doing uh, this, um, in this particular collection, um, we explored uh, the role, the fundamental role that family stories and family narratives may have in the life of children. So what we will do in the spirit of this being museum learning and digital museum learning in this collection, what we will do is we're going to engage on a little bit of thinking and looking closely into a work of art. Um, I'm going to ask Philippa to show this work of art for us for a second. I'm going to take a moment. We're going to take a deep breath. I'm going to take a moment. Um, first to look. I'm going to ask you to look very closely and notice what you see. What do you see in this? And maybe you can jot some notes. ¿Qué es lo que vemos en este cuadro? La tamalada. ¿Qué vemos? So feel free to write on your on, on the chat in Spanish or in English or in Vietnamese, or whatever language is comfortable to you. ¿Qué es lo que vemos? ¿O qué que a gente ve en ese cuadro? <laughs> Micheline, what do you see? What do you notice? Oh, my goodness. I see families working together. Um, mm -hmm. to accomplish the task that they're they're having fun, you know mm -hmm. they're all they're all working in unison and mm -hmm. talking to one another. Mm -hmm. It's a very it's a very peaceful um, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a, a a place for me uh -huh. uh, of cooking, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see too. So some some kids. Some people are interacting in smaller groups, some people interacting peacefully making tamales. You know, Carola, Philippa, what do you see? What do you notice? I, I notice collaboration, I notice observation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different people taking different roles. Yeah. I also see bright colors, which makes it feel very lively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we have you know, Darren is saying here that he sees, you know, garlic on the wall. Uh huh. <laughs> also, I know that people are engaging a calendar on the on the wall that seems to be transitioning between months. On its own, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Better, it, it, all, it also is very intergenerational. You see the little ones helping. There's, you know, older people. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, okay. There's a man, living, you know, wearing overalls. Uh -huh. Looks like he yeah. came in from yeah. working outside. Uh -huh. So let us shift into um, what this image makes us feel. What's the feel of this image, you know? What does it make us feel? Warmth. 
Yang. Uh -huh. What else? What other words come to mind when we think about the emotion or the, the feel that this image conveys? Uh -huh. Closeness. Closeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anticip anticipation to eat the tamales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. uh -huh. Excellent. Super. What does it make us feel? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. It makes us feel like it makes me feel like this trust. This yeah. trust in. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Happiness, togetherness, joy, safety, comfort. It has a feeling of belonging to me, busy. Thank you so much for adding your thoughts uh, to, to the chat, your feelings. We're going to transition to uh, wondering what, what does it make us think about? What do we think about when we look at this image? You know, what ideas come to mind? You know, um, it's making me think about the importance of religion in family life by virtue of that what feels seems like the last supper image in the background what else does it make you think about mm -hmm. you know when, it makes me feel like to anticipate when my daughters come home for Christmas and we all bake pies, that uh -huh. idea that we're all in the kitchen making things and it's mm -hmm. a, a warmth mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it brings these memories to you. Uh -huh. That's great. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about what a luxury it is to have the family united and together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Lynn says it makes her want to be with her, with her family. Mm -hmm. um, convivencia, so just living together. Mm -hmm. Lots of really rich ideas here. How food unites families. Thank you, Claudia. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How many Latin American families are separated by the violence of imperialism and capitalism. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the question of wonder, the question of wondering. This image raises questions for us. So what questions come to mind? What are we curious about? Either within the scene or beyond the scene, as the scene invites us to think about families. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder about how we can sustain and and continue with these traditions that are so beautiful and how mm -hmm. how can we as a society help families treasure this gift that it that they have mm -hmm. in their traditions i think mm -hmm. it makes me happy to see this and it also makes me a little sad Mm -hmm. How do we generate opportunities, more opportunities for these moments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's great. All right. So with that, thank you so much for engaging um, into with uh, you know for us engaging together in this in this exploration um, of um, um, Lomas Garza's uh, Tamalada. It's a beautiful piece we're going to come back to it a little bit later on so let me um with this inspiration and this sort of sense of you know in our bodies and in our minds of you know family moments um i would love to invite us to um to hear a little bit from carola about um about why sharing family stories uh, matter the heart of the matter for us in this particular mm -hmm. collection would be family stories and sharing them We'll do that, then I'll share a little bit about the, the collection that we would like to introduce to you. And then Micheline is gonna tell you about what happened with this collection on the ground. So as we move forward, feel free to post your questions on the chat in any language you choose, and, um, and we'll do our best to, to try to respond to them as much as possible. Thank you. Carola. 
Thank you so much, Vero, for setting up such a the, the conversation in this beautiful way. And I will be very brief because I would like to get to the substance of uh, what you and Micheline will uh, lay out so beautifully. But I want to just introduce a little bit of why family stories are so important and why migration and immigration can interrupt and fragment the flow of family stories. So as I was thinking as we were contemplating that picture, that painting, uh, that, it, you know, although it is just uh, in two dimensions, or we, we, uh, we could almost hear the chatter and smell the smells as we, as we take it in. Uh, and you can imagine all the stories that are just flying around uh, as, as, as folks are interacting. And, and immigration, sadly, interrupts many of the family stories that naturally happen when people do not migrate. And in fact, I believe it was Grant or, or one of the folks in the, in, the, uh, in the chat mentioned that how many Latin American families uh, have no longer the, as many opportunities to, to have these family stories. And I, wouldn't, I would say it's not just Latin American families. As people cross borders, grandparents get left behind, aunts and uncles get left behind, certain parents get left behind for periods of time, children get left behind and parents go ahead. And so there are these interruptions along the way that clearly uh, break up the natural flow of stories. And then when families are reunited or parts of families are reunited, uh, often immigrant families are extremely busy. They're working one or two or three jobs and long hours, and they don't always uh, coincide with when the, when the children are, are awake. And so time often interrupts the ability to chat, chit chat about anything other than pragmatic issues like, did you do your homework? Get to bed, brush your teeth. Uh, I need a new pair of shoes. Um, and then family traumas often also interrupt the parents or, and the caretakers' uh, willingness to talk about things that happened that they don't want to upset the children about. So uh, stories get lost along the way for those reasons as well. And then sadly, children sometimes go through a stage where they're feeling a little embarrassed and a little ashamed of their uh, parents' accents and their parents' you know, ways that are not in keeping with the new space that they're in. And for that reason, uh, stories become get lost along the way more often than we would like them to. Uh, and I'm speaking now as a psychologist, not even as a, somebody who's a, a thinking about language, but there are lots of reasons why stories are important. And if we can get to the next slide, please, Philippa. So why do stories matter? Uh, they matter for a lot of reasons. Psychologically, and uh, they, they bind families together. Stories bind us together. They give us a sense of who we are as a family. They give us a sense of who we are as individuals and where we fit in the greater scheme of the, the mosaic of life. Uh, and so they're extremely important for fostering identity. So for those just those fundamental reasons, they're extremely important. They're also important for linguistic reasons. The chatter, the, the movement, the, the conversation, the more you talk, the more you develop language skills in either language, either the native, and often in immigrant families, there's more than one language involved. So there are two or three languages. And the more we use language, the more we, uh, not only solidify our identities, but also um, solidify our linguistic skills. Um, and so engaging in family stories matters because for a series of reasons beyond identity, including fostering conversational skills, which are lifelong skills that are useful in so many ways, it, it, they generate curiosity. Uh, they generate the capacity to take perspective. Oh, this happened to you? Huh, that's interesting. Uh, it, I would have seen it this other way. Or, you know, Tia uh, Ramona talks about uh, how she experiences and then Tio uh, Juan talks about how he experiences it a different way. So the, the, this capacity to take perspective is so important. Empathic skills also are developed in the exchange of stories. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, engaging in family storytelling is central to the lifeblood of family well-being, 
as well as identity formation, as well as a whole slew of social emotional learning um, and, and the very foundation of uh, academic learning. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, uh, Veronica, please. And, and uh, as, as you... Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Carola. Um, so, essentially, then, what can a museum do, and what can a uh, what can a digital collection do in order to foster family story sharing and 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 foster the type of depth that you know that Carola was was describing, where where really sort of language is a window into each other's lives when we can use multiple languages, and and when 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 the goal is really meaning making, bonding, sharing, uh, identity. Uh, construction, healing, participation, belonging, um, all of this. So in front of you, you have, I'm going to share, yeah. Um, in front of you, um, you have uh, this uh, digital collection that we have created. And this particular version, you'll see it in both English and, and Spanish. So you can uh, you can log into it and sort of after, after this, um, uh, after this uh, this session, what we'll do is um, we'll and you'll be able to access it in one or the or another language or uh, in both languages as you see this um, right here. So this collection uh, is called you know um, recording, retelling, connecting family stories. O nos conectamos compartiendo historias de familia. Um, and I'm going to give you like a very brief overview of the collection so that you have a sense of the flow uh, of this design uh, and the opportunities for thinking, learning, sharing, and enjoying um, that, that the collection um, presents. Um, and then um, Micheline will share with us, you know, some beautiful, um, beautiful stories of what happened on the uh, on the ground in Fairfax, you know, this last summer. Um, so essentially, this. Um, collection includes, you know, um, a piece about if you were to sort of click and uh, tie like this one very, very briefly, you would find sort of some materials about, you know, why collections like this one, uh, why um, sharing stories, family stories matter. Um, then you'll find an invitation to spend some family time and particularly an invitation to explore works of art, just like the one that we have seen, the Camelada by Lomas Garza, with a few routines or a few questions, you know, that might help in the close looking and digging deeply into a particular uh, work uh, of art. Um, there are other works of art that are really beautiful to think about family, connection and bonding and belonging. Um, and then there's an invitation uh, to meet Lola, um, or to meet, which is uh, the main character here of Juno Diaz's uh, Island Born, uh, or Lola as translated into Spanish. And this is a beautiful story. I'm very grateful that Carola suggested that we use this particular story because it's a story of, um, um, of an uh, Afro-Caribbean girl who's very, very curious. Um, and um, she is, uh, uh, she is you know, a descendant from, um, um, from the Dominican Republic. That's where family is from. Uh, and all of a sudden in school, the teacher asked them to write a story or to about, you know, the places where they are from. And she realizes that she really doesn't remember anything because she might be when she was very, very young. Something very similar to the experience that Juno Diaz himself had migrating from uh, the Dominican Republic. So, um, so she's, 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 uh, she's conflicted, you know. How how do I have this identity, and yet I don't, um, I don't quite know, you know, what my drawing, what my story is going to be about. Um, and being quite a curious girl, she then begins to ask questions, ask questions of her grandma. You see her sort of um, uh, writing and taking notes, you know. And they 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 interview a variety of family members, and she gathers all of these stories in order to produce uh, eventually the story of the island where she's from. Um, and so what you see there is sort of some of the, you know, some of the, you know, sort of the, if you were to click into this, uh, the, these tiles, you would find uh, readings of the story, you would find uh, some information about uh, Juno Diaz. And what you see after that is, you know, the images that uh, the children that participated in the, um, in the program that Micheline is going to be 
uh, sharing with us and, and Claudia is going to be helping us inform it through the chat um, as they are reading Lola, engaging in the story. The story has a moment that's difficult, which is, you know, when uh, why migration happens, why Lola's family leaves and it's about the dictatorship and through his dictatorship, um, uh, you know, terrifying the moment in, on the island, which is an interesting opportunity to engage with kids from stories that typically are not told. Um, and yet it's an invitation for us as adults to, to understand how to frame, what lessons uh, we can yield from some of these very difficult stories that we, so many of us um, have experienced. Um, after that, there's an invitation to uh, to interview, to find for the kids themselves, you know, to find participating kids and parents and um, uh, to find uh, family stories. So there's a variety of questions that they can use. Um, and then an invitation to share stories and different ways of sharing and sharing through art, sharing by writing books, sharing by you know, digital uh, stories. Uh, there's a variety of ways in which kids get to share some of these stories. I'm anticipating that you'll enjoy hearing, um, you know, hearing Micheline's account of some of these. Um, and eventually we figured that it really, really matters to, to ritualize the story sharing. So to make sure that, that story sharing and, 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 and storytelling um, is, is, should not be something that happens once in a lifetime in that very special moment, but it should be something that becomes a habit in the family. And then how do we create habits? How do we ritualize the story sharing? And so we came up with the idea that perhaps the kids could create a totem, like an artifact that would be the reminder to put on the table when it was time for, sure, time for sharing stories, time for asking questions, time for inquiring, time for for, for using the languages that we have at our disposal in order to learn from one another. We will see later on um, some, uh, some responses from, from mounts that are, um, that are really quite powerful. I'll share some of those with you. Um, I think that that is pretty much it. So you have at the end of the collection um, a series of uh, invitations uh, to share stories in other ways. So that is pretty much it and with that uh, and with an invitation to see you know what you would do next with a collection like this um i'm gonna uh, pass it on to micheline who's got quite a bit to tell us so micheline you tell me um what you would like me to share thank you Mero. and um and carola and philippa uh, first i want to acknowledge um that many of the family literacy teachers are here uh, awesome. some of my colleagues from the esol office are here hello everyone i'm so excited you could come um and i'm moved that you're here uh but most of all is uh, claudia esteves is here yes. and claudia uh, co-constructed um this workshop with me uh, she is an ESOL teacher for the Family Literacy Program in Fairfax County, for Fairfax County Public Schools, um, and passionate about, uh, about families um, and uh, in creating experiences for families that go way beyond the teaching of, the, of English, um, right? So I, I have to say that this opportunity um, to, to be able to give the gift of storytelling to our families um, it was amazing for everyone involved, not only for us who um, were lucky enough to be involved in this project, uh, but also uh, for our teachers and for our parents. What happens is m many of our families, you know, live in isolation. And when you live in isolation, um, you kind of lose, lose sight of, of the things that, that maybe once you held dear maybe of the things that are in your heart or the traditions that you had maybe once when, when you lived in your country before you migrated. And so um, I think that if I had to think of one thing that we gave the families, I think it was this idea that yes, they could celebrate their language and they could celebrate their traditions and they could kind of revive all of this, right? Um, in the home. It didn't take any more money. It didn't really take any more time, just with the time that they had that they could do this. So what we did, we started thinking about how are we going to kind of engage the families with this collection? So we started with the tamalada. As you all saw, you, you, everyone is, is, it's very easy to engage with la tamalada. Um, 
because um, we all have these memories, even from different cultures and different parts of the world. But, you know, we all love to eat. Right. And we all love to cook. And 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 food is a central part of culture uh, for most of us. And so, oh, my goodness, the, the conversations that happened. And this was a virtual, by the way, it was a virtual a workshop. It was four sessions virtually. And um, at the beginning, we started um, a WhatsApp group. Um, Contar nuestras historias, we called it, uh, telling our stories. And we encouraged, it was um, Veronica's um, idea to say, okay, well, why don't we encourage the moms um, to start sharing everything they're doing with their kids? Because the idea was we would meet once a week or no, it was twice a week for two weeks, right? How are we, how are we going to know that this is working? How is it that they, how can we instill the pride in what they're doing actually in the home? And we had a tremendous, tremendous um, uh, participation in this. Everybody was sending their WhatsApp pictures. Many of the things that you see in the collection were sent through WhatsApp that we picked up. Um, children coloring, uh, making pictures of, of the Lola book, um, uh, children playing hopscotch, uh, mothers uh, cooking with their children, mothers going on walks with their kids and telling stories. So I'm going to break it up to you a little bit so you understand how the workshop went. Um, because I think for educators, it's easy. It's, I think it's great for you to leave with something you can take back and perhaps replicate, right? Um, so day one was the big introduction. Why are, why are stories important? Why is passing on heritage and culture important for our kids? What does the research say about children who come who, who enter school with high self-esteem and a place of belonging, knowing that they fit in, you know? Uh, what is that? And how and what is the family's role in helping children um, eh, be proud of their heritage and of their of their home culture and traditions? And so we started that way, and because we know that all parents, all parents want the best for their kids. And all parents, especially those parents who have migrated and, and at great cost sometimes, want the best that the world can give their children. And so we thought, we, we told them, you know, if you start just telling your stories and making it fun and playing games and cooking with them and, and really engaging your kids every day, a little bit, every day, not like Veronica or Carola said, once in a lifetime. This is an everyday. This this has to become ritualistic. It has to become everyday, right? A little something, a little nugget. Um, and they started really getting into it, you know? They started sharing how they were cooking and what the children were saying. And they started sending us videos of the children talking to them about what they were cooking. Um, so it was it, it was just really incredible. We used the uh, see, feel, think, wonder routine uh, to make them think of what did what did Tamalada, what does this painting make you think of? And they said all kinds of things. Some moms said, "Oh, it reminded me, you know, for Easter we would go, um, we would go to the beach." Um, in Central America, it's very common to go to the beach right on Easter week and how we would make this, all these wonderful meals and cook together and take huge picnic baskets to the beach, etc. We had hundreds of stories. I have to say that we pulled from two schools in Fairfax County. Uh, one is Bailey's Elementary School that has a very, very high level of um, uh, Guatemala mothers who speak Ichil. And so, I mean, imagine the richness of the culture. They speak Ishil, they speak Spanish, and now they're learning English. And all their traditions, and it was incredibly powerful, the things that they said and how they felt in the United States, being a minority times two. People speaking Spanish to them when they sometimes didn't understand Spanish that well. No one was able to communi communicate with them in their own language, for example. Um, and then we took, there were two moms from the Graham, Graham Road Elementary School where we have another, another program. And one of them was Vietnamese. Remember, Vero, 
uh, Lan. Mm -hmm. and, and Lan was married to a Bolivian man and had three little boys. And she said, it's really funny when I started telling the stories, one of my boys really wanted to hear everything that was Vietnamese, didn't care about the Bolivian at all. And the other one only wanted to hear about the Bolivian stories. He didn't care about the Vietnamese stories. And then one of them likes Vietnamese food and the other one likes Bolivian food. And anyway, it was so rich with her because she was the only uh, participant that didn't speak Spanish. And, you know, it didn't really matter. It, it, she enriched the environment uh, that we were working for, uh, with, right? Um, so, uh, so that was day one. Every single day, we gave them homework. Beginning on day one, we had a uh, YouTube reading of Lola. So day one was Tamalada, day two was Lola. Reading Lola and talking about this experience of not remembering the past and how, how they feel about that and how their children might feel about that, right? Um, and so for a whole week before we actually did the Lola, they were able to listen to Lola in Spanish or in English through a YouTube reading. So we prepared them already. They were already prepared. Also, we bought them the book. So everybody got a copy of Lola. So they had the book. They were able to look at the beautiful pictures of Lola. And they also had the reading. Uh, so day two was all about um, stories. And we also, of course, created for each um, workshop, we created um, a, a informational sheet with ideas of what questions you may ask your children, prompts, what games you might play with the kids, uh, what kind of, um, some, some of, many of our parents had nurse, um, uh, preschool age children. So what nursery rhymes in Spanish would, do you remember a singing or maybe your mother sang to you the lullabies? Mm -hmm. So it was a very, very complete program in the sense that we, we were expanding the vision to look at art and to see a collection um, that, that the Learning Lab collection that we have, which is so rich, and at the same time, making it their own. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we were imposing, we were saying, hey, look at this collection, you have to do everything that's in here. It, that wasn't the point. The point is that a collection like this can start really rich conversations and mm -hmm. can trigger um, mm -hmm for families, um, it could expand the, 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 their vision of, of how they see themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they see, oh, look, there's the tamalada. You know, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can relate to, to los tamales. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can relate to Lola. Mm -hmm. So in that, in that sense, um, it was just extremely rich. Um, so day two is Lola. Um, we started, we thought, with Claudia that we were gonna be able to have them do family interviews. And this is interesting from a programmatic standpoint, you plan things and you think, oh yeah, we can do this, but it, it doesn't always work out. And it's okay if it doesn't work out. But the moms just, they were very afraid of the technology. They didn't know how to do the videos. And, and so at one point with Claudia, we, we thought, you know, let's not push about the interviews because we're afraid that they're not going to come back because they're going to be embarrassed not to have something. You know, it's like the dog in my homework or, oh, I'm not going to go to class today because I don't have my homework. So I didn't do what I did, what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to be reprimanded. And so we let it go. And we, instead, we thought, we're not going to have them interview um, family members at all. We're just going to have them continue having these conversations. And then at the end, in, in when we do the, the final workshop, which is which was also the celebration, we will interview them and ask them, what did you learn? Um, what do you what did you what did you enjoy the most? Um, have you changed any of your behaviors after taking this this mm -hmm. after being exposed to this workshop? You know? Um, what 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 new uh, ideas have you incorporated into your daily life? And when we heard the interviews with uh, with Vero and 
And I was listening to them and I'm telling you, it was just amazing. You know, almost across the board, they said, ah, I'd forgotten how much fun it was to tell stories and to be and spend time with my children. And I'd forgotten how, how to play with my kids because we're all so busy. Like Caro said, you know, we're busy, busy. And, 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 and immigrant families are very busy. Sometimes they work two jobs and they see their children sleeping. Mm -hmm. They don't see them awake you know, except for the weekend. And so the idea that they could take these little nuggets of time and, and transform them into these beautiful, wonderful, happy times where turn the music on. Why, why don't we listen to music and dance anymore? You know, why, why can't the home be a happy home where we dance and where we play? We can still get our work done, but we could do it in a happy place, you know? So that was really wonderful. So day mm -hmm. four um, it was the final celebration. And I don't know, Veronica, you were there. I was there. It was amazing. Two of my kids were there, so I dragged them there. But I know, they, they loved it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we did a celebration where we brought food and spread it all over the grass area in front of, of the schools. Everybody brought food. And we're talking... There, you know, we're talking abundance, abundance, abundance of love, abundance of sharing. Uh, there wasn't a second of, 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 you're like, oh, nobody, they don't want to contribute. They're the kids. So Vitter briefly mentioned the artifact. So we decided, okay, well, we're going to do an artifact, which is going to symbolize time to stop time to read, time to tell a story, time to turn off the screens, time to play a game, time to whatever you want to do that's fun and we can play. So at the, at the celebration, we everybody brought a rock. We had some extras just in case somebody forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Digging up rocks in my garden. Um, and then the children painted them and they took their artifacts with them at home. And so anyone in the family could, could de designate when that time was, they all had the power. A child who's four, I would say, oh, time to play, put the rock somewhere on, on top of the, the couch, where, wherever. So here are the rocks. Um, and then we had these, these, these wonderful interviews. And um, uh, uh, Beto, can you show the pictures of um, the, the little girl playing um, hopscotch? Yes. So, and you just you can just signal some of them, and I'll tell the story. So he, this is this is one of the little girls um, that when we were talking about traditional games and things like that, the mom said, "Oh yeah, I decided to make her a hopscotch," um, and oh my my daughter just loved it and loved it, and she played. She didn't want to do anything but play hopscotch, and there she is. Um, <laughs> There's so, a whole instructional video as to how you play and how oh, you yes, that's right. heaven that's and right. so forth. It's really beautiful, absolutely. I, I had forgotten that. <laughs> I had forgotten that. Um, yeah, and then um, there's once that there's one beautiful picture. We're talking about literacy, right? Um, yes. That they made up a a makeshift light a home library. Look at that. Yeah. Here's this little boy saying, showing his library, his home library. The um, librarian, right? Yeah, he was a librarian and there was his books and he was, you know, showing us um, his books. Um, there are, let me see here, there's a lot of... Um, so uh, I, yeah, the... the, the typical, about this. Yeah, that one. The typical clothing. And this reminds me of a little story. So... Claudia and I decided to do these PowerPoints and we would start every workshop with celebrating traditional music and from different countries. So we, we, we looked at all our, our participants and said, okay, we have Guatemala, Salvador, um, we have Vietnam. Uh, and then we researched some, some music and some dances and, and, and some typical clothing, traditional clothing. And one of the moms, after we played a video, and I'm sure Claudia remembers this. Um, it was a, you could tell it was like in a little courtyard in a kind of a rural area where um, a, some teenagers were dressed with their typical 
outfits and they were dancing this typical dance. And then we asked the mom who was from Honduras, we said, oh, did you do that? And she answered, very sobering. No, I wish I could have. My, you know, I, I, I love those, 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 those dances in my school, but my mother didn't have the money to buy me the, 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 the typical dresses. Mm -hmm. So I never participated in, the, in those dances. And, you know, so many stories come out, so many, so many beautiful and wonderful memories, but also some sad memories. Mm -hmm. And so if you do a workshop like this, you have to be really prepared mm -hmm. to, to listen, yeah. to really listen and, 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 and be compassionate and empathetic mm -hmm. with, with participants. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to and holistically celebrate all of them, mm -hmm. the whole package. You know what I mean? Not just, oh, everything's cool, everything's great. It's, Michelle, you know. yeah. yeah. Michelle, I know, that, I know that folks may have some questions and comments and so forth, so we're going to keep track on, on mm -hmm. what you have to, what you'd like to ask you know, us to, 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 to speak about, um, about this, uh, this uh, experience. I don't know, uh, Philippa, if you see uh, some questions or comments that you'd like to put forth that would be that's that's great um in the meantime one of the things that i love about you know about sort of the the what happened in these only four meetings which is was really quite magical was how much you know little by little the whole family participated in the case of this particular girl the aunt who lived in Honduras you know make sure that you know this girl would get her traditional clothes and so forth really really very very um very powerful engagement of transnational dialogues on whatsapp so the whatsapp was not only internally here sort of in fairfax and so forth but really sort of all across um, across the continent, and that was really quite exciting. Um, another piece that I thought was really fantastic is this idea of um, invitations to conversations. Again, a yo-yo, uh, a hopscotch can be an invitation to conversations, long conversations. Uh, a book is an invitation to conversation. We try to interrupt the idea that you read the book from the beginning to the end. It's like, no. The book is there, you hop, you, you move around the book, you move around the images, you use all of the languages that a book represents and the languages of interaction and, and, and communication and sharing in order to in order to, to make a book an opportunity for, for family story sharing. Right? If, if I may make a comment as I'm listening to this, you know, for all the reasons, obviously the, the psychological reasons, the family closeness, the literacy reasons, all of those are obvious reasons to engage in uh, in an activity like this. But I'm also struck by, you know, one of the standard complaints of many schools and many community organizations is that they have trouble engaging, quote unquote, parents, engaging family, engaging caretakers. And as I listen to this, how much more engaged could your parents have been in all of this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so one more benefit, it seems to me that we should call out is 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 a, is a way to engage families you're you mm -hmm. you brought them in you clearly showed the respect you have for them for mm -hmm. their culture uh for their family relations and boy were they that right there with you mm -hmm. and yes. so I, I just want to underline that mm -hmm. uh that thank you benefit. Carola, that's a really 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 good point Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot said about family engagement. Yeah, and disengagement. Then. Yeah. Not a problem when you do it right. That's right. That's right. That's so true. I wanted to talk about really uh, one big outcome that I had. I know we're probably running out of time. How are we with time? It's 53. We're, we're close. I'll say it really quickly okay. because I think this is really important for us, for family literacy in Fairfax County. For us, if the experience of storytelling and the, the realization um, that stories, that families are enriched by their stories and their culture, really transformed our curriculum, mm. transformed our vision and what we think is important in family literacy. 
it mm. went from just, you know, for preschool environments, we have 10 preschool environments from, oh, the shapes, the colors, the ABCs, to no, how about art? How about expression through art? How about uh, telling the story of the book? So mm -hmm. it became, um, you know, the, the idea the, that families need to be celebrated and affirmed. Um, it became embedded into, into what our, our, our foundational beliefs are. And mm -hmm. so it, it has really transformed the way that I look at the program as the program leader. It, yes, all of those things will come in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, but, mm -hmm. but the foundational piece of families, they come from mm -hmm. the family themselves and from mm -hmm. their own, from the heritage. Mm -hmm. And I love sort of adding to that. I what I loved was the transformation that we saw in these moms. You know, like the reshaping, rewriting of who they were, what their role was. One of the moms was saying, you know, it is my role as a mother to really keep these family conversations alive. So all of a sudden, it's an expansion, it's an empowerment, it's a really deep human development. For Lam, she wondered. Oh, I realized that I that I that I don't know if I remember what Vietnam was like when I was a kid, you know, and I need to find out my story. So it was mm -hmm. so meaningful because I think that it was really when we think about education at its best. And education at its best is human development. It is the development of human potential, human capacity, human bonding. And I think that when we start with the human, when we start with the person, when we start with the family, the group, then 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 the rest will fall into place. You know, the vocabulary will come, the grammar will come, all of that will come. And how much do we miss when we when kids uh, are in a way signaled to leave their languages, their family stories, their identities um, at the door of the school in order to come and perform academically in a language that is not theirs. Right? So I think uh, I think we have so much to continue to work in this um, in this realm. But let's see, Phil. Do you see some questions that you would or points that you would like us to to take? I um. So yes, please do put your questions in the chat. I don't think there are any yet. Um, but when we were planning this session, Micheline, you had al also talked about how some of your teachers were skeptical of the mm -hmm. project, that they thought it sounded just a little bit too simplistic. Maybe can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah. And we'll see if any other questions come in the chat. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was more about this, the use of certain books like Lola. Lola's not a preschool book, right? It's not preschool level. It's much higher than that. And so it was the idea that they were kind of stuck in the fact, oh, no, I'm, why are you going to give those to families? What, what can I do with that? My, my, my families don't speak it at all. They don't speak English at all. How am I going to transfer what Lola is about in English and, and communicate with my, my parents? Because family literacy is adult ESO and um, uh, preschool. It's both. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program that kind of encompasses a lot. Um, and so, but the idea that this is a springboard to a conversation, mm -hmm. that this is an inspiring, just, just looking at the pictures and the colors will inspire children to color or to tell a story. And so yeah. I kind of a change. Yeah, if, if I could build on, on that idea, I think what I heard from you and as you talked about it is that it, it, it inspired these cross uh, cross generational, so it, it, the, you know there were slightly older siblings. It, there was an entry point across the family because in families typically there's you know there's a, there's a four year old and a seven year old and a nine year old and you know and so people entered it at different places and they scaffolded one another and it it, it was a, a place to engage in conversation uh, and ex and exchange ideas and thoughts and each person entered it in a different way. So I. You know, I think it's again, it's an important part of cross familial conversations. Yeah, and I and I and I and I love that what that you both say because I think uh, when we think about it in terms of language, sometimes we think that we need to fit the book exactly to the reading level of the child, but that is because we're thinking about about. Um, the child read really it themselves. Um, exactly. Exactly. I think I think we think about the decoding of written language, but when we really f focus on the story, 
and the meaning making and the capacity that young children have of making sense of very complex issues as long as we give them the opportunity and then we scaffold them you know to deal with with, with issues that might be scary like you know like you know like the monster that was depicted in the uh, in the in in the book you know about the dictatorship and the coup you know. so so i i love this idea of interrupting a notion a very linear and an oversimplified notion of of language by by also opening up um, this opportunity across generations, as you say, Carolyn. Pero we have a question uh, from uh, Manuel who says, what was the language of instruction for the program? And uh -huh. I can tell you it's it was in Spanish. However, Lan, who spoke Vietnamese and English, had a private interpreter, and her name was Veronica Guam. <laughs> <laughs> who on the side was interpreting everything we were saying to her over the phone. <laughs> I didn't know you spoke Vietnamese. No, 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 thank you are a English. <laughs> it was in English. It was in English. So, but it was in Spanish. The program was in, was delivered in Spanish. And there were a lot of comments also from teachers. Um, Arnie Garnier says, yes. Um, she says another benefit is also the value in developing your children's oral language and even in their own home language will lay the foundations for their for their early literacy skills and that's such a great that's mm -hmm. such an important po point marnie because the many people just i mean they say they understand that that the home language is 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 needs to be i mean that the language is developed in the home language but then they they don't support that they just say it <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a very important point, point to make. Mm -hmm. So in the collection, and also sort of, um, uh, Philippa will share a little bit later on, you know, in the collection you find a series of links to, to really, really interesting interesting things. For example, you know, Carola um, and some colleagues, you know, uh, Adam Strom uh, and others who have been working on this notion of story telling, story sharing, so there's a whole guide to it. Uh, so there's plenty of you know practical um, tools uh, as well that might be helpful uh, to think about. Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, put some links into the chat here that you're oh, referring to. Yeah. So another so another point to um, point to highlight. Um, um, Michelle and, and, and Claudia, I loved the way in which uh, the moms, you know, connected with one another and the way in which they found themselves, including the dads who would perhaps not normally participate as much in these kinds of things, you know. So, so really um, the idea that this is about families and it's the whole family and this invitation for families to connect and reconnect locally or globally. Um, I thought that that was also sort of a really beautiful highlight of, you know, of, for me at least, in watching and, and participating in sort of the stories that were shared. Yeah, and uh, do you remember the video of uh, Lan's husband, who's Bolivian, dancing the cueca? Yeah. <laughs> it's a traditional, a traditional dance. And, and me, Lan, who's Vietnamese, is dressed as a Bolivian Altiplano uh, woman, <laughs> and he is playing the guitar, and she's dancing like Wicca. It was just so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And, he, and, and I think that again, so look at the richness of these families, and how come we at the school don't get to see that, right? So what if, you know, we really, really, really opened our minds and, you know, from a school's perspective, what if we really were to, whether we're a teacher, you know, whether we're like family engagement person, whether we're a principal in whatever role we play, how can we get to not miss the richness, the cultural, linguistic, you know, um, you know, generational richness um, of family life of our kids and really find more continuities between what happens in a classroom and what happens in life. Um, I, think, I think that it would be a dramatically different education if we were to do something along these lines. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I don't think we have any questions left in the chat, mm -hmm. um, but I'd really like to thank our presenters for being here today. And um, we invite you to keep in touch with us. You know, we'd love to know how we can support you. We'd love to have your feedback. 
please feel free to write in the chat or write to us at learning at si.edu. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if, does anyone want to say anything in, in closing uh, or will? I definitely would love to, I, I would love to thank you, Philippa, you know, for, you know, for, um, you know, for all of the support, the encouragement, for the guidance, you know, thank the Learning Lab for, for really literally supporting this work, uh, not only in, 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 in all sorts of ways with you know, expertise and, um, and um, I'm extremely grateful to, to Claudia and to, to the moms and the children who are participating uh, and really helping us see the wisdom that, that remains so many times unseen. Uh, so thank you. I would love to thank Philippa, Micheline, and Veronica for taking, you know, these sometimes abstract uh, intellectual ideas that I have as an academic and putting them into practice, into real, real family and children's lives. And I hope that this has given inspiration uh, to those of you who have participated in, in, in this uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I would finally like to thank, of course, Veronica, Philippa, uh, Carola, for the uh, uh, honor to work with all of you. Um, it's been, I've learned a lot and it's been amazing and there's nothing better than I like than to fill a blank canvas. Um, you know, I'm not much of a linear thinker, but I'm a very expansive thinker so um, and creative so that I can fill something that doesn't exist. And to have this opportunity um, to give this richness and to, to share um, the, this gift uh, with families um, has inspired me uh, to continue the work, you know, uh, and to expand it now, uh, to continue with this. We're not done yet, Vero. No, no, absolutely not. And speaking of not being <laughs> done, we're beginning to we're beginning to plan our whole. Not done. Yeah, that's right. We're the only beginning, and so and we're planning a whole series around the, the issue of migration. So uh, we're working uh, on a series of webinars for two thousand for twenty twenty two. So stay tuned because uh, because there's more coming, and and there's really as you say, Micheline, lots of work to do ahead, and really beautiful people to be working with. So um, thank you. Excellent. Merci bien. Au revoir. Um, Thank you so much. Oh. We, have, we have one of our participants, one of our moms, Mireya Ayala, who says, gracias a ustedes por tomarnos en cuenta. For Ay, inviting me. Mireya. Mm. Mireya, and there's Lily. Gracias, so, muchas gracias, Mireya, por estar acá. Gracias, Mireya, de verdad. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, both our, our wonderful presenters and our wonderful people in the audience and in the chat. And thank you, everyone, for your work to make families happier and healthy and, and communicating. Um, so I invite you also to check out the Learning Lab Help Center um, for more programming, and, and we have lots more to come. So thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow.